So a while back, I read this book, White Flight, Black Flight, The Dynamics of Racial Change in an American Neighborhood by Raquel A. Waldorf. Waldorf is an academic at Cornell University. She looks at a town uh, called Parkmont. Now, that's not the real name of this town. We know it's somewhere in the northeast uh, of the United States. Apparently, it's a convention in sociology to um, uh, use a pseudonym to protect the identities of the people uh, that she interviews and also to get more honest answers uh, from the research. Parkmont was a working class town in the 1940s which had a large Jewish population and was known locally as Little Tel Aviv or Kike's Peak. That's what the Catholic uh, people called it. Um, it was only 2% black in 1990, but by 2000, uh, it was over 58.8% black with very few whites. Now, Parkmont uh, did not have its own school, and the local population, including the Jewish uh, population, would send their kids to a nearby school called Wynn Hill. It was a bus ride away, and they were perfectly happy to do this. Um, but then in the 1960s, the black population in the surrounding areas began to grow uh, rapidly, and uh, the Jewish community in Parkmont responded by lobbying uh, the local uh, government to establish a new school called Lombard. And they were successful in this. Lombard was built, and most of the peoples were Jewish. Um, and the children from Parkmont could now go to Lombard, and the black kids were kept out because they were, of course, outside the catchment area, and they could not afford uh, to move to Parkmont. Now, Parkmont in the 1960s uh, was a destination for other groups to go to. Non-Jews, known to Jews as Gentiles, became a presence in the area. The newcomers uh, were mostly first and second generation Italians, with some Irish also. Parkmont was seen as high status to these groups, and the school, the brand new school, um, uh, what, what was it called, L Lombard, uh, this was seen as the main attraction. Um, and I will quote uh, Waldorf uh, at some length on this. She says, the large segment of working class Jewish families who remained in Parkmont learned to tolerate and in some cases embrace the Italian and Irish Goyim. After all, Jewishness continued to dominate Parkmont's reputation, power structure, institutions and cultural life. Parkmont residents were far more threatened by the black population that had crowded into the neighborhoods uh, located just a few miles away. Like most of the city's whites, Parkmont residents were cognizant of the possibility of black encroachment. Everyone knew someone whose neighborhood had changed over. However, families in Parkmont took comfort in the fact that their community had remained solidly white. They felt protected in their defended community, which was characterized by strong leadership and involved residents. In addition, they knew that the houses in their neighborhood were unaffordable or inaccessible to blacks. Like so many white ethnic working class areas, Parkmont had an unwritten code that prevented blacks from finding any affordable homes that might be for sale. Uh, lawn signs were banned. As one elderly stayer said of such signs, one time somebody put up a sign and the next night there was no sign. Somebody took it off. This informal no sign policy helped to stave off racial change for a long time because blacks could not simply drive around and find homes for sale. Additionally, realtors uh, knew that if they showed Parkmont homes to black families, they risked alienating white residents and sabotaging their own earnings and careers. Thus, Parkmont residents felt secure in their certainty that their neighborhood would remain unchanged despite the shift in surrounding communities. However, in the 1960s, uh, the county that Parkmont was in uh, instituted a busing uh, policy to promote racial integration. Of course, this had already started earlier in the 1950s, but now this new school that they had built, Lombard, came under the new policy and black peoples were now admitted to Lombard and it failed to remain a white-only school. Of course, the Parkmont uh, parents lobbied against this, but on this occasion they failed. 
the Parkmont population responded by removing their children from the schools and sending them either to a Jewish day schools or Catholic day schools, depending on the family. Thus, by the 1980s, Parkmont had become a majority black school. Even though the black families weren't living in Parkmont at this point, the, the children were living elsewhere and then being bussed in. So after uh, the Lombard School became integrated, Parkmont uh, began to experience white flight. The first people to move away from the area were Jewish families who sought out other neighborhoods known for having a significant Jewish presence. Many of these uh, were younger families with school-aged children, so you can see that they were moving because of the school. The exodus opened up the Parkmont housing market to black families for the first time, and the change in the town was rapid. One new black, uh, black Parkmount uh, resident um, reminisces about this. They say, let me tell you something. Black people say to me, they'll say, you know, our neighborhood changed. And I'll say, yeah, it's changed as far as being a white neighborhood to being a black neighborhood. It changed. And this is something that I've said. It was just like the plague was coming. Like once the blacks started buying, it's like the plague. When we came up here, it was nothing to have 10 or 12 for sale signs for a block. Whites didn't want to live around us, so they left. They were out of here. It was like, we gotta go, we gotta go. As houses were going for sale all over the place, I told my husband one time, I'm like, damn, you know, we went to sleep and we woke up and the whole neighborhood is black. We didn't used to see that many blacks. It's like we went to sleep in the winter and it changed just that quick. Now, people cited three main reasons for leaving. Uh, one is just simple rach racial prejudice and discrimination, although Waldorf is at pains to point out that this was only a very small minority of cases and she couldn't actually find any. Um, then the second uh, uh, reasons that people gave <clears throat> is what Waldorf calls non-racial factors, such as crime, schools, services, and property values that, quote, often coincide with racial change. And the third reason is simply that the housing needs of a family has changed. So that's either people scaling up or scaling down. So let's say you have a family with one child uh, who live in a two-bedroom house. Now they need to move to a three-bedroom house or uh, vice versa. You have a, an older um, family whose kids have grown up and now um, they want to move into a smaller accommodation. So these are, uh, you know, normal reasons that people uh, move. But it's actually this second factor, um, the non-racial factors, um, that Waldorf focuses most of the study on. And that's what I'm going to be spending the rest of this video on as well. Now, house prices fell in Parkmont because the total number of residents decreased over time. You can see the total population in 1970 was uh, 9,313. Uh, this, by 2000, had gone to 7,768. Um, and you can see that as those white residents moved out, the, um, there weren't as many black residents uh, moving in to replace them. Also, the demographic changes are extraordinary. The percentage of uh, black people in 1990 was uh, 2.2. By 2000, it's 58.8. Uh, the white percentage was 99.6 back in 1970. That went down to 33.2 by 2000. And if you have a look, um, most of the uh, black people um, were in uh, owner-occupied homes. The percentage of black home owner-occupied um, residences was 73.7 uh, by the year 2000. So most of these people that we're reading about uh, were home owners eventually. Um, now three types of Parkmount residents uh, left. Uh, so basically after all of the, uh, after the white exodus, we've got these three different types of residents who are left in Parkmount. Um, the first uh, group are what uh, Waldorf calls elderly stayers. That's older Jewish and white people who felt too settled to move or for whatever reason they didn't move away. The second group are pioneers. That's the first black residents to move to Parkmont. 
Uh, and then the third group are the second waivers. That's the black residents who moved in after most of the Jewish uh, and the white uh, exodus had already taken place. Now, one of the interesting things that Waldorf finds is that the original population taught the pioneers how to integrate into the community and its social norms. Parkmont had a lot of very well-established social norms. For example, uh, at one day a week was trash day. That was when the bins um, uh, were meant to be uh, put out and taken away. Um, everybody was expected to mow their lawns. Everybody was expected to paint their fences um, and their gates. Uh, in the winter, people were expected to shovel uh, the, the snow. Uh, they were also told uh, where to vote. However, by the time most of the original population had left, a lot of these social norms went by the wayside. Established local businesses and stores closed down and attempts to replace them struggled. Many residents expressed unhappiness with the quality and the stability of the new local stores and restaurants after their poor uh, and, and also complained about their poor and shabby decor. We saw overflowing trash uh, frequently near bus stops. Old businesses now had ugly security bars instead of their nice old uh, storefronts. Uh, while some lawns are still neatly, neatly manicured, others have garbage strewn on the grass in the form of Chinese takeout advertisements, candy wrappers and discarded cups. It is common to see uh, homes that show signs of age with old, broken or worn out doors, peeling paint, bare lawns, cracked cement and rusted railings al along the front stairs and often found on the doorsteps of homes are dirty faded outlines of uh, mezuzahs that is jewish ornaments containing scripture which symbolized that the house was once owned by somebody of jewish heritage and it is frequent to see uh that is houses that are boarded up uh, or one that is abandoned and surrounded by tall weeds but these kinds of homes are not yet uh, the norm so you can very much see a neighborhood in chronic decline um, just 10 years after these changes have taken place. Now one of the reasons that Waldorf points to is that while the pioneers learned to adopt the old social norms um, and integrated into them, they failed to pass these on to the second waivers who did not show them any uh, respect. As soon as the pioneers um, uh, learned to, of what was going to happen with their neighborhood, they also moved away and so Parkmont experienced what is known as black flight following the white flight. So the original uh, black migrants to the area now wanted to move out because the neighborhood's gone down. One pioneer aged 37 who had moved to the area when she was in her 20s said before you didn't really have to go outside your home and sweep up trash. You just had to go and do your leaves and a little litter. But now it's McDonald's papers, it's cups, it's whatever. Now we have a Popeye's coming. And uh, for British viewers, I believe Popeye's is a um, is a kind of fried chicken uh, fast food establishment uh, that they have in some parts of America. Waldorf contrasts between the pioneers and the second waivers. And Jackson, who is a pioneer, uh, sums up uh, the principal split well. She says, when we came here uh, and wanted to be accepted, it was mostly a white neighborhood. We came in and we had no problems. We didn't want to cause any problems. We just wanted to work, take care of the home, fix it up, live and be happy. The new people that came up here didn't care as much. The first group that came up here, we tried to fit in. We did as everybody else did. We didn't throw stuff around when we came in. We would get out and we'd sweep up the front of our house and clean up to keep it the way it was. And the reason for this is that the pioneers move for aspirational and what Waldorf calls assimilationist reasons. They sought to integrate with the dominant group as an ethnic minority respecting the fact that the uh, white majority population had a certain way of doing things. Whereas when the second waivers came in, they saw themselves moving to a black neighborhood and were neither interested nor able to merge into the pioneers' cultural milieu, uh, reflecting a more general lack of assimilationist values that goes beyond 
race, according to uh, Waldorf. And now this is uh, George. Uh, he is another one of the uh, pioneers. He says, now when Joanne, who was a white stayer, uh, and then was over here, we didn't have too much of a problem because they stayed on top of it. Mr. Henry, he stayed on them. He'd be knocking on the door. You get that abandoned car off the block. He'd call somebody to get it off the street. And uh, now this is Waldorf talking. She says, I suggested to George that some black residents might resent such interventions from white stayers, taking offense at comments that could be perceived as racist, insulting or judgmental. I said that I thought it might rub black neighbors the wrong way. However, George adamantly rejected this insinuation. No, he said, they was rubbing us the right way, the right way. As soon as they left, you've got all this trash back here and nothing but abandoned cars in the driveway. And that's very interesting that George reacted at the insinuation of racism uh, in that manner. Now, this is uh, George's uh, daughter, Sonia McCall. And she says, it's horrible. I've seen it over the years, how the neighborhood has changed. When I moved up here, it was real quiet. You didn't see no boys in the corner. You didn't have all this activity. I think the problem is that when people was moving in, they brought their sons, kids, and a lot of parents. They think just as long as the kids don't mess up the house, the kids can stay out. They out on the street. I believe it's going to get worse because the kids are growing up and they coming in, bringing in more kids. And they got no control over them. The neighborhood's going to go down, says Sonia McCall. And this is a final um, uh, uh, account from Nina Jones, another pioneer. Nina is a teacher, apparently. Uh, she says, right now, we're, gonna, we're trying to move. One of my girlfriends wants to move up here, but she's single. I don't, I don't recommend it for people who want children or who have children. I don't recommend it because you want an area where, number one, the kids can be outside and play. You just never know what's going to jump off here. The neighborhood is failing. And if it's like this now, what's it going to be like in 10 years from now? And I think that's very interesting uh, what she says about the kids. And uh, Nina Jones is a teacher in Lamont School. The original reason for all of these people moving to this area. And it just goes to show that things can change very rapidly. And that's all I wanted to uh, share in this video. I thought uh, some of these findings from Waldorf were interesting. You can make of them what you will. But uh, it's quite a nice reality check. Now get out.